Section One of Birds and All Nature, Volume Seven, Number Three, March nineteen hundred. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. The English Sparrow, F. S. Pixley. You may talk about the nightingale, the thrush, a meadowlark, or any other singing bird that came from Noah's Ark. But of all feathered things that fly from turkey buzzard down, give me the little sparrow and his modest coat of brown. I'll admit that in the springtime, when the trees are getting green, when again the robin redbreast and the bluebird first are seen, when the bobolink and blackbird for the southland reappear, and the crow comes back to show us that the spring is really here, I'll admit that in the springtime, when the groves with music ring, nature handicaps the sparrow he was never taught to sing. But he sounds the maker's praises in his meek and lowly way, and though other birds come back at times, he never goes away. There's a certain sort of people that, when the skies are bright, will hang around and talk about their friendship day and night. But if things cloudy up a bit and fortune seems to frown, they're sure to be the first to kick a feller when he's down. So when summer skies are bright and it's easy enough to sing, but when it's cold and rains or snow, it's quite a different thing. In autumn, when the nip and frost drives other birds away, the sparrow tis the only one with nerve enough to stay. And even in midwinter, when the trees are brown and bare, and the frosty flakes are fallen through the bitter, biting air, the sparrow still is with us, to cheer us when we're glum, for his presence is a prophecy of better days to come. The sparrow's never idle, for he has to work his way. You'll always find him hustling long before the break of day. He's plucky, patient, cheerful, and he seems to say to man, I know I'm very little, but I do the best I can. What more can you and I do than to always do our best? Are we any more deserving than the little British pest? So when you talk of feathered kings, you'd better save a crown for the honest little sparrow with his modest coat of brown. End of section one. This recording is in the public domain. Section two of Birds and All Nature, Volume seven, number three, March nineteen hundred. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Peacock With pendant train and rustling wings, aloft the gorgeous peacock springs, and he the bird of hundred dies whose plumes the dames of Ava prize. Bishop Heber. It was a saying among the ancients, as beautiful as is the peacock among birds, so is the tiger among quadrupeds. The birds are of many varieties, some white, others with crests, that of Thibet being considered the most beautiful of the feathered creation the first specimens were brought to europe from the east indies and they are still found in flocks in a wild state in the islands of java and ceylon the common people of italy describe it as having the plumage of an angel the voice of a devil and the intestines of a thief in the days of king solomon his navies imported from the east apes and peacocks an alien relates they were brought into greece from some barbarous country and that a male and female were valued at a hundred and fifty dollars of our money it is said also that when alexander was in india he saw them flying wild on the banks of the river high Arotis, and was so struck with their beauty that he imposed a fine on all who should slay or disturb them the greeks were so much taken with the beauty of this bird when first brought among them that it was shown for money and many came to athens from surrounding countries to see it it was esteemed a delicacy at the tables of the rich and great and the birds were fatted for the feasts of the luxurious hortensius the orator was the first to serve them at an entertainment at rome and they were spoken of as the first of viands barley is its favorite food but as it is a proud and fickle bird there is scarce any food it will at all times like it lays waste the labors of the gardener roots up the choicest seeds and nips favorite flowers in the bud 
he requires five females to attend him often more the peahen is compelled to hide her nest from him that he may not disturb her sitting she seldom lays above a dozen eggs which are generally hatched about the beginning of november though the peafowls invariably roost in trees yet they make their nests on the ground and ordinarily on a bank raised above the common level the nest consists of leaves and small sticks from january to the end of march when the corn is standing the flesh is juicy and tender but during the dry season when the birds feed on the seeds of weeds and insects it becomes dry and muscular in some parts of india peacocks are extremely common flocking together in bands of thirty and forty in number covering the trees with their splendid plumage and filling the air with their dissonant voices captain williamson mentions that he saw at least twelve or fifteen hundred from where he stood peacocks are very jealous of all quadrupeds especially of dogs when they are discovered in a tree situated on a plain if a dog is loose and hunts near it the birds will rarely move but will show extreme uneasiness one of these birds in the north of ireland was a curious mixture of cruelty and fun he had four mates but he killed them all successively by pecking them to death for what cause no one could ascertain even his own offspring shared the same fate until his owner placed the peafowl's eggs under a sitting hen and forced her to hatch the eggs and care for the young his great amusement was to frighten the chickens there were two iron troughs in which the food for the chickens was placed daily no sooner had they gathered about them when the peacock would erect his train rattle his quills together with that particular rustling sound that is so characteristic of these birds and march slowly towards them the poor little chicks would slowly back away from the troughs as the peacock advanced not wishing to lose sight of the food yet not daring to remain in defiance of their persecutor by degrees he got them all into a corner crouching together and trembling when he would overshadow them with his train place the ends of the feathers against the wall so as to cover them rattle his quills in order to frighten them and then strut off proud of the trick he had played he did not care for the food which he left untouched the peacock's disposition is as variable as that of many other creatures some being mild and good-tempered while others are morose and jealous in the extreme his train though popularly called his tail is in reality composed of the upper tail coverts which are enormously lengthened and finished at their extremities with broad rounded webs or with spear-shaped ends the tail feathers are of a grayish brown color seven or eight inches in length and can only be seen when the train is erected that being its appointed task the female is much smaller than her mate and not nearly so handsome the train being almost wanting and the color ashy brown with the exception of the throat and neck which are green the peacock lives about twenty years and the beautiful variegated plumage of the male's train appears about the third year after birth end of section two section three of birds in all nature volume seven number three march nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org by larry wilson the song of the lark ada m griggs a peasant girl her feet all bare with her rustic grace has a noble air she's queen of the stubble field and she in mind is free as the lark is free her thought above all meaner things is soaring with the lark that sings no hampered child of the city streets who bows his head whomsoever he meets who toils for a pittance with little rest but should envy the freedom in his breast she's the child of nature vice does not lure she's clothed upon with a life that's pure the wholesomeness of her atmosphere does more for man than his logic drear who delves in books philosophic lore sees nature's problems but little more tis god's own child who has eyes to see what is closed to the eye of philosophy the artist who dabbles with color and brush sees but the reflection of nature's flush 
the skilled musician knows not pure tone but hears but the resonance of his own tis the peasant girl as she hurries along who hears the lark's good morning song she hears it with gladness her heart is gay all nature greets her in a festal array the lark makes her world a world of song his notes in her heart sing her whole life long she's the true musician artist and seer she looks upon nature with vision clear the lark brings her day without shade or sorrow and crowns each day with a sweet tomorrow he gives a joy only nature can a boon sent down from heaven to man o oh, little lark sing on sing on the country dark new life will dawn the tones thou'lt hurl from thy tiny heart peace will unfurl and a new joy impart end of section three this recording is in the public domain section four of birds and all nature volume seven number three march nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org by matthew sherry the herald of spring before the snow flies a bit of summer skies come flitting down through winter's frown to cheer up waiting eyes one gray february day when dirty patches of snow are still lingering on the north side of rocks and walls as you gaze across a dreary landscape you espy a bit of bright color on the bar post that brightens up your spirit tis the first bluebird and that means that spring is coming his cheery little ditty seems to say spring is coming spring is coming spring is here he has been farther south during the winter for he seldom stays in massachusetts in december and january and he thinks it a little chilly just now for his feathers are all fluffed up around him so that he looks like an animated dumpling he has come back to locate his nest site to see first if the old nest hole of past years is suitable for he is a great home lover and if not to select a new one in march you will see the bluebirds often investigating rotten bar posts hollow cedars old woodpecker holes and decayed apple tree stumps and in the latter part of the month the females are with them then one april day mr bluebird sings always from a limb of a certain apple tree and down in the trunk in an abandoned woodpecker hole are four pretty light blue eggs every old orchard has its family of bluebirds and they come back to the same nest every year until something happens to scare them away from it a rotten bar post or fence rail is a promising sight also and they peck out a hole with their short bills and round it out as neatly as that feathered carpenter the woodpecker when they get in a little ways you may see the chips flying out of the aperture though no worker is in sight and when it is almost done every now and then a blue head will pop out with a beak full of loose wood which is tossed away then a few clean chips are left and the bird's own soft down lines the home often they will make use of the wooden boxes set on poles or placed in the trees for their benefit and they are very quiet peaceful birds so the entrance to their homes should never be much larger than their own small bodies require for admittance the scrubby cedars that grow along the new england coast make excellent nooks and corners for the bluebird's home and the berries provide him with food late in the season i have even found a pair nesting in a cedar grove on the extreme end of a rocky point exposed to the full force of the southeast storms that sweep up buzzards bay usually however they prefer the green fields in the orchards of further inland one pair for five or six years nested in a hollow about twelve inches deep formed in the crotch where a cedar tree branched into two parts it could not have been a comfortable or well-chosen home for it was open to the weather at the top and it would seem it must be flooded in a heavy rainstorm but it was only abandoned by the birds when it had become known to every boy and egg collector in the village as the hereditary estate of this family during april and may the blue bird is everywhere visible and audible but in midsummer he 
he is not so often seen. He is essentially a bird of the spring with us. His familiar contemporaries are the catbird and the robin, but he is the earliest in the year of them all. Sometimes, though not often, he stops all winter with us, and his red breast warms the winter landscape which it dares to challenge. See him dash from that old fence post, after a mouthful of flies or gnats, or hopping from twig to twig in the cedar tree, selecting the choicest of spicy berries. Sometimes he will venture in among the crowd of talkative sparrows that are harvesting the crumbs in your dooryard, but if they dispute his right, he keeps away. The piece of suet hung in the tree near the bird box, however, is his own, and he views the intruding buntings and trespassing jays from his front porch or dormer window with much indignation. However, he says very little, and uses no bad language like that of the jay, and soon regains the sereneness of temper natural to him, and we like him all the better for it, for, although it is not nice to be imposed upon, and we like to see the offenders get their deserts, the one who takes life cheerfully and uncomplainingly overlooks or forgets the wrongs he cannot right is the one we like to have as a friend. End of section four. This recording is in the public domain. Section five of Birds in All Nature, volume seven, number three, March 1900. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Matthew Sherry. March. March. It is the first day of March, each minute sweeter than before. The red breast sings from the tall arch that stands beside the door. There is a blessing in the air, which seems a sense of joy to yield to the bare trees and mountains bare and grass in the green field. Love, now a universal birth, from heart to heart is stealing, from earth to man, from man to earth. It is the hour of feeling. One moment now may give us more than fifty years of reason. Our minds shall drink at every pore the spirit of the season. Woodsworth End of Section 5 This recording is in the public domain. Section 6 of Birds in All Nature, Volume 7, Number 3, March 1900 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Taming Birds, Guy Steely But very few of the boys and girls who watch the many species of our birds flit about in the summertime and who listen in delight to their singing know that by expending a little time and patience they can make these sweet songsters quite tame. I do not mean that the birds are to be caught and confined. I never could bear to see a bird in captivity, and indeed most wild ones will live but a brief time when so served, but that they can be made gentle in their natural state. Where I live in the Rocky Mountains, there are countless numbers of birds throughout the spring and summer months, and, being a great lover of them, I have naturally observed their habits closely. Trusting, therefore, that some of the boys and girls who entertain the affection for them that I do will see these lines, I venture to give some of my experiences along the path of bird life. Some five years ago, I constructed several miniature cottages with verandas, chimneys, and all, and placed them on the fences around our garden. The first season, two pairs of wrens selected and occupied two of them. A third was chosen by a pair of bluebirds, and a fourth left vacant. Wrens, as you all know, are never much afraid of anyone, but bluebirds are inclined to be shy. After a short time, however, the pair I spoke of would alight within a few feet of where I was weeding vegetables, and soon came to know that, where the ground was freshly turned, there were to be found the most worms. Before the summer was over, the wrens and bluebirds and I were the firmest of friends, Daily they ran and hopped and peeped under the plants and flowers. And besides giving me their companionship, they did a vast amount of good in the garden by keeping it clear of bugs and worms. 
it was astonishing the number of these they carried to their little ones but time stops not and finally there came cold and frosty nights that warned my little friends now comprising three families that the day of their departure for warmer lands was drawing near and soon i was all alone every year since then has been a repetition of this first only that i have more houses around now and consequently more tenants i firmly believe too that the first three couples still return to their old homes for the same houses are taken by the wrens every spring and the same one by the bluebirds during the winter also i sometimes have a few bird pets though they are others than snowbirds the latter i have never been able to make friends with when the weather is severe i often try to feed them but with poor success as they are always very wild the pets i have reference to are blue jays and camp birds or as they are more usually called camp robbers both species stay here the year round last winter i had a laughable time with them shortly after the first snow i noticed a pair of camp robbers they seem to go in pairs both summer and winter around our meat house if you've never seen one of them you cannot know what comical birds they are so solemn and innocent appearing yet when it comes to stealing well they're the greatest and boldest thieves you can find if they're about and you chance to have anything eatable around and turn your back for a moment you're pretty sure to find it gone when you look again i remember while camping one fall of seeing one of them dart down from a tree and take a slice of meat right out of the frying pan on the fire but it was too hot to hold for long and mr camp robber was obliged to relinquish his dainty dinner before reaching his perch again arriving there he sat for a long while looking down at me with a wry face but i'm digressing and must get back to my story of the camp robbers in the meat house a few days after i first saw them i went in the house to cut some meat for dinner while there one of the robbers alighted on a bench placed at the side of the door and stood peeping in i cut a small piece of meat and tossed it on the step and in a second he had pounced on it and was away every day from that time on just at noon the pair of them would be watching for me and i made it a rule to put out small pieces of meat or bread on the steps at that hour of the day as soon as i retreated a little way they would secure them and fly off after they had been with me about a month a blue jay happened along one day and seeing them at their meal invited himself to partake of part of it the camp robber seemed somewhat angry at this but did not venture to remonstrate the next day there were two blue jays and by the end of the week i had two camp robbers and seven blue jays looking to me for their daily dinners i fed the whole company all winter and when spring came the camp robbers would almost take food from my hands in fact they seemed to look to me for protection when eating from the blue jays who were rather overbearing and wanted more than their fair share whether they will visit me this winter i know not but i do know that i should be glad to see them again End of section six. Section seven of Birds and All Nature, Volume seven, Number three, March nineteen hundred, recorded for LibriVox.org by Betty B. The Willow Ptarmigan, Legopus Legopus, C. C. M. It has been claimed by some ornithologists that this species of grouse is not to be found in this country but it is now well established that it may be found in northern portions of new hampshire and northern new york in summer it is distributed throughout arctic america it breeds abundantly in the valleys of the rocky mountains on the barren grounds and along the arctic coasts davy who is probably the best authority we have says that the winter dress of this beautiful bird is snow white with the central tail feathers black tipped with white in summer the head and neck are yellowish red back black
barred rather finely with yellowish brown and chestnut although the most of the wings and underparts remain white as in winter large numbers of the willow ptarmigan are said in the winter to shelter in willow thickets and dwarf birches on the banks of lakes and rivers where they feed on the buds of the smaller shrubs which form their principal food at that season their favorite resorts in daytime are barren sandy tracts of land but they pass the nights in holes in the snow when pursued by sportsmen or birds of prey they dive in the loose snow and work their way beneath its surface nests of this species have been found in the anderson river region early in june and as late as june twenty fourth others have been found on the banks of the swan river as late as june twenty seventh one nest was observed july tenth which contained ten perfectly fresh eggs and another set of eggs was examined july twenty second the contents of which were slightly developed the nests were mere depressions in the ground lined with leaves hay and a few feathers from the birds themselves these birds often occupy the same nest in successive seasons ten eggs are usually laid though the female is said to lay as many as sixteen the eggs have a ground color varying from yellowish buff to deep chestnut brown more or less sprinkled speckled spotted or marbled with rich brown or black the average size is one point seven eight by one point two five halleck says that the various species of ptarmigan are all alpine birds and are only found in the north and on the highest mountain ranges they are to be distinguished from all other members of the grouse family by the dense feathering of the tarsus and toes by turning white in winter and by the possession of only fourteen tail feathers the bill is very stout and the tail always black the length of the ptarmigan is about sixteen inches it is a most delicious article of food whether roasted stewed or in white soups it is said that visitors to newfoundland assert that the flavor of a plump partridge well cooked is unsurpassed in richness and delicacy a brace of them in season weigh from three to three and a half pounds on the first of september they are in prime condition after feeding on the wild partridge berry and cranberry their favorite food when on the wing it is said the scarlet tips over the eyes of the male bird glisten like rubies the cock exposes himself fearlessly when in danger to save the lives of his offspring he tumbles along the ground a few yards in advance of the dogs rolling there in order to decoy the sportsman from the brood which the hen is anxiously calling into the thicket no more touching instance of paternal affection could be witnessed or more touching proof among the lower creation of self-sacrifice prompted by love the poor feeble bird would almost attack dogs and men in his efforts to save his children at times in some districts the ptarmigan is so tame that it can be killed with a stick and at others so wild that it will not allow the sportsman to approach within gunshot end of section seven this recording is in the public domain section eight of birds and all nature volume seven number three march nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org by betty b animal pets in school a wise old man down in boston says animal pets should be kept in public schools to teach children kindness to the weak the jokesters are already at work deriding one of the best thoughts anybody has had about education for a long time because it seems and possibly is impracticable they call it a reversal of the mary's lamb doctrine and suggest the propriety of letting the children throw paper wads to teach them accuracy and precision despite both its doubtful practicability and the jester's little fling dr edward everett hale's proposition is not only founded on a right theory but reflects the very way in which nature says the chicago journal first taught the great lesson of altruism and love most of our scientists and some of our religious teachers nowadays believe that man ascended from the beasts if he did the first kindness the first unselfishness 
the first compassion for the helpless and gentleness toward the weak that were ever in the world the first things that ever differentiated man from brute were taught to the parents of the race in exactly the way dr hale would have them taught to its children there never was any human love until there was human helplessness there never was any mother love or father love until children began to be born that were feeble in some of the lower orders of life the young can take care of themselves as soon as they are born there is no reason why anything should care for them so nothing does there is no affection for them nor from them nor among them love was first excited by something that needed care and kindness a couple of shaggy savages animals that didn't know enough to love each other yet felt something akin to pity for an ugly baby with a gorilla chin and no forehead and resolved to do something not for themselves but for the hideous infant and not because they were proud of its prettiness and wanted to keep it for a plaything but because it so obviously needed to have something done for it that the scientists tell us was the beginning of unselfishness the beginning of care for others the origin of affection and altruism the genesis of humanity the promise of the destiny of man the baby was the animal pet that got into the schoolhouse with the children of the early world and taught the first lesson of love on its mighty weakness hung most of those powerful and wonderful forces that have lifted brutehood into manhood heredity does a great deal but most of the lesson has to be taught over to every individual and it is a more important one than geography or grammar humanity's happiness and further progress depend on the thoroughness with which it learns the lesson not of arithmetic or spelling but of altruism children are cruel but they have hereditary instincts of kindness for the weak that would develop the sooner into love for their fellows if they had something helpless to exercise them on when a big hulking selfish boy begins to take a protecting interest in a little yellow dog he is unconsciously teaching himself the greatest lesson he can ever learn trotting around in that woolly hide dodging stones fleeing to him for protection from the pound man getting lost and kicked starved and hurt is the beginning of the boy's unselfishness and the man's altruism and it is not funny but sad that the schoolhouse door must shut it out so that the reluctant master may the better give his attention to the mysteries of commercial arithmetic and the art of skinning his fellow man by means of brokerage discount and compound interest dr hale may never see animal pets in the schools but he has been in the world a long time and knows what humanity needs end of section eight section nine of birds and all nature volume seven number three march nineteen hundred this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b bailey's dictionary c c marble this may be called the age of dictionary making all philological scholarship seems to culminate in historic derivation without referring invidiously to cultivated foreign languages each of which has many such monuments of elaborate accurate and patient research it may be said with confidence that the english language is unrivalled in its lexicographers who at the close of the nineteenth century have completed works which only a few decades ago were not thought of as possible dr johnson prepared his unabridged dictionary in seven years with little assistance from the great an achievement which at the time excited wonder and admiration though insignificant indeed in comparison with present performances and yet there may be some doubt about the comparatively greater usefulness to the general reader of the bulky volumes of the modern publishers in illustration the reader might find an analysis of one of the oldest english dictionaries an interesting example for several years i have had at hand an universal etymological english dictionary and interpreter of hard words 
by n bailey seventeen forty seven on almost all occasions when i have needed to consult a dictionary i have found it satisfactory some of its learning on account of its very quaintnesses and contemporaneous character being better adapted to a particular definition than modern directness perhaps its greatest defect is the absence from it of scientific terms of which however there were very few at that time the introduction is exceedingly learned and the causes of change in language are discussed with much ingenuity many examples of saxon antiquities are given one of which the lord's prayer written about a d nine hundred by alfred bishop of durham we may quote from which it doth appear says bailey that the english saxon language of which the normans despoiled us in great part had its beauties was significant and emphatical and preferable to what they imposed upon us here is the prayer our father which art in heavens be hallowed thy name come thine kingdom be thy will so as in heavens and in earth our loaf supersubstantial give us to-day and forgive us our debts our so we forgive debts ours and do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from evil the introduction is in latin greek hebrew and saxon characters are used in the definitions bailey defines the meanings of proverbs with far more particularity than is necessary perhaps and yet a small volume could be made up of these curious common or old pithy sayings as he defines them many of which are obsolete or unknown to the readers of the present day instance as sure as gods in gloucestershire this proverb is said to have its rise on account that there were more rich and mitred abbeys in that than in any two shires of england beside but some from william of malmesbury referred it to the fruitfulness of it in religion in that it is said to have returned the seed of the gospel with the increase of an hundredfold and good wine needs no bush this proverb intimates that virtue is valuable for itself and that internal goodness stands in need of no external flourishes or ornaments and so we say a good face needs no band one other a short one all goes down gutter lane this is applied to those who spend all in drunkenness and gluttony alluding to the latin word gutter which signifies the throat not a few of these proverbs with their explanations occupy whole pages of the dictionary and where they are traced to the greeks or the hebrews the original characters are brought into use as incontestable evidence of their authenticity definitions are numerous of words which while perfectly legitimate and of saxon origin and of common usage in the age of elizabeth are omitted at the present day from lexicons in deference to the prevalence of a more delicate taste the book contains about one thousand pages is printed in a style little dissimilar to present unabridged dictionaries and must have been of prodigious assistance to the author's successors he does not deprecate the labors of his predecessors whom he acknowledges to have saved him much trouble but he claims to have omitted their redundancies in order to make room to supply their deficiencies to the extent of several thousand words in no english dictionary before extant and that he is the first to attempt it an etymological part this very important contribution to english literature far more important then than any similar performance could be now is strange to say nowhere mentioned in what is regarded as the best history of english literature and just here the remark might be appropriately made that omissions of this kind in standard literary histories and cyclopedias go far to call in question the qualifications of the editors a word may be overlooked or forgotten but a scholar who has contributed substantially to the growth and enrichment of a great language deserves a better fate end of section nine Section 10 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 3, March 1900. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Stellar's J. Cyanocitus stellari. The J is a jovial bird, hey ho! 
he chatters all day in a frolicsome way with the murmuring breezes that blow hey ho hear him noisily call from the redwood tree tall to his mate in the opposite tree hey ho saying how do you do as his top knot of blue is raised as polite as can be hey ho oh impudent jay with your plumage so gay and your manners so jaunty and free hey ho how little you guessed when you robbed the wren's nest that any stray fellow would see hey ho this is an abundant and interesting cousin of the blue jay and is found along the pacific coast from northern california northward it is a very common resident of oregon is noisy bold and dashing the nest of this bird is built in firs and other trees and in bushes ten to twenty feet from the ground it is bulky and made of large sticks and twigs generally put together with mud and lined with fine dry grasses and hair the eggs are three to five pale green or bluish green speckled with olive brown with an average size of one point two eight by point eight five there seems no doubt that many jays have been observed robbing nests of other birds but thousands have been seen that were not so engaged it has been shown that animal matter comprises only about twenty five per cent of the bird's diet end of section ten this recording is in the public domain section eleven of birds and all nature volume seven number three march nineteen hundred this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by tavarish linen fabrics w e what a m we had just taken that delightful ride down the rapids of the st lawrence and experience the thrill of mingled pleasure and fear which every one has at the moment when the vessel is dashing at a furious rate directly towards a great rock and we were sure that someone had made a mistake for once and no power could save us from being dashed in pieces when a sudden whirling current of the stream picked the ship out of the way of the rock and carried her safely through the boiling foam into a place of comparative safety as we stood among the sea-going shipping of the port of montreal we could easily understand why there should be such a great city there we took but little stock in what had been said of the great business enterprise of the early settlers of that town and how they built up the place till it became a great seaport and an important commercial centre no doubt they were able and enterprising men but montreal was made by nature the greatest and most important seaport of canada by the peaceful deep river and its formidable rapids since no ships can sail up those rapids the boats that came from europe and all over the earth were obliged to tie up there and discharge their cargoes wherever there is a ledge of rock to stop the coming up of vessels from the sea there is always an important town to receive what those ships bring and to distribute it over the country round about we went aboard a ship that had just come in from france loaded with cases of wines as the wines were being carried ashore at some of the gangways loads of something else were being brought aboard at others this stuff was done up in sacks longer than a man and very heavy it took several men to handle a sack they were so careless about it that we wondered that they did not fear breaking the contents of the sacks then we wondered more what sort of stuff could be shipped to europe in such sacks and in such great quantities we inquired and it took some little time to make the inquiry for the men who did the work spoke something that sounded like french but our school french did not suit them we could find no one at hand who spoke english we learned that the sacks contained oil cake linen has been woven since records of what man has done have been kept 
some historians claim that cotton is the oldest fabric and give instances of old records of its use in india and china others claim woolen goods to be the oldest and yet others claim the honor for linen whoever looks into the matter extensively will be inclined to give the credit to whichever fabric he studies most but it is likely that the fig leaf will be credited with the greatest age as a fabric by most people the seed of flax is ground fine either roasted or raw and placed under heavy hydraulic pressure this brings out the oil which is a very important article called linseed oil the cake is valuable for feeding cattle and the oil is used in all kinds of painting where the painted surface has to stand against the weather most of the flax raised in america is cultivated for the seed mainly in ohio three pecks of seed are sown to the acre and from six to twelve bushels are harvested there is also a ton or two of straw to the acre which is used at the rope walks and paper mills linen paper is peculiarly valuable the mummies of egypt were swathed in linen and much of this cloth is now in an excellent state of preservation although at least four thousand years have sped since its manufacture while joseph was in bondage cloth was woven which is still in existence there was once some question as to whether certain mummy cloth was of cotton or linen but that has been definitely settled by the use of powerful lenses the microscope shows that a fibre of cotton is flat and curly like a ribbon somewhat crinkled and like a fine ribbon has a beautiful border which differs from the rest of the fibre a fibre of flax has a glassy lustre and is not flat like cotton but rather like an extremely fine bamboo rod cylindrical and jointed when these facts were learned regarding the two fibers the cloth under suspicion was placed under the glass and showed unmistakably that it was round transparent and jointed so there could no longer be any doubt that the ancient coverings of the dead in egypt were all of linen with no mixture of cotton even when cotton was well known the dead could not be buried in cerements of wool because there was a strict law against it the wool being supposed to invite worms the remarkable preservation of the cloth is largely due to the fact that it was well smeared with wax and asphaltum but the fibers of flax resist decay to such an extent that in the ordinary process of preparing flax for spinning it is moistened and left exposed to such an extent that if it were as easy to decay as cotton it would become rotten before the time for spinning the earliest records of the business of preparing this useful fabric are those of the egyptians as cut in stone on their ancient monuments in their hieroglyphs and illustrations they have left us a complete representation of all their arts and the processes of gathering flax rotting off the bark and coating of the fibers cleaning the material by striking with clubs or whipping it against stones straightening the fibers twisting them into threads and weaving cloth are all beautifully pictured and described when william the conqueror invaded england his wife matilda made a record of the principal events of his life by embroidering upon a linen strip twenty inches wide and two hundred and fourteen feet long figures of men boats animals weapons and other interesting objects using woolen thread and depicting all with great clearness and accuracy the bishop of Oda assisted her husband at the battle of hastings and in remembrance of his kindness matilda presented the work to the cathedral of bayo it is now preserved in the public library of that city 
Two hundred years ago there were spinning schools in Germany. The teacher sat with a wand in her hand and tapped the children near her when they lapsed into idleness, and when she noticed any of those at some distance from her not at work, she rang a little bell for an attendant to enter and take the offenders out of the room for the purpose of punishment. The old Dutch settlers in New York made what was called Lindsay Woolsey. This was a sort of cloth made with linen warp filled in with woolen woof. It was better than all wool goods because it held its shape better and was stronger. This material was much worn by the early inhabitants of America. Abraham Lincoln being one of those who were well satisfied with home-made garments of this fabric. Irving, in his Knickerbocker's History of New York, claimed that some of the Dutchmen, whose names ended in Burke, were so called because of some peculiarity pertaining to their breeches. For instance, Ten Burke took his name from the rare distinction of his possessing and wearing at the same time ten pairs of linsey woolsey breeches when people began to show their prosperity by purchasing cloth made up more beautifully than the product of the homestead loom they had to endure the remarks of others who affected to despise the men who was so extravagant as to care to dress in store cloth so recent is the use of this old-fashioned material that we find in one of louisa alcott's essays to girls the statement that quote, modesty is as sweet in linsey woolsey as in linen end quote. the greatest country in the world for the production of linen of the best quality is ireland flax there reaches a height often exceeding two feet and the soil and climate seem to be the very best for maturing the fiber and manipulating it when gathered. In traveling through the country I saw a great deal of what at first glance seemed to be some sort of grain lying on the ground spoiling in the rain. I soon realized that this was flax, and that it was left out on the ground purposely to give the pulp and bark a chance to rot away from the fiber. Dew retting is letting the flax lie in the heavy dews of Ireland till the work is done. Soil on which flax is raised is rapidly made poor unless the richness that is taken from it in the flax is restored to it in some way. Most of this richness is in the seed and the part of the stalk that is removed in the retting. Where this gets back to the soil, there is little else to be added. Sometimes the flax is retted in small pools, and the water saved to put upon the ground, though the flax is more discolored by this process than where the work is done in running water. Recently, steam heat and vapor have been used to soften the stalks, and then the air pump draws the pulp away from the fiber, so that what once took several weeks to do is now done in a few hours. By the old process, the fiber was sometimes left stacked dry for years with constant improvement in quality. The Irish people, who are so proud of their island, point with additional pride to what some of their linen towns have done. As we were riding past the little village of Bessbrook, a clergyman took pains to point out to us the evidence of thrift. He said that town lacked three P's that are very troublesome to other towns all over the world. They were the pawn shop, the public house, and the police. The good character of the people made these entirely unnecessary for their town. But these good qualities are not universal there, for in some of the larger places intemperance is remarkably bad. We saw the work in all its stages at Belfast. Queen Victoria gets her table linen from that city, and we saw several pieces in the loom that had the royal arms upon them. To get the finest fabric, the fiber is kept moist in both spinning and weaving. 
nothing can be more beautiful than the silky transparent stuffs made there dry spinning is done where a coarse and heavy grade of goods is desired american visitors in ireland especially the gentlemen plan to bring home as large a quantity of linen colors cuffs and handkerchiefs as the customs officers will allow to pass at new york free of duty the finest linen goods are called lawns and this name is a modification of the french word linon which sounds more like lawn when spoken properly the french made many fine articles from all sorts of fibers and seem to have recovered from the blow to their industries which came on the revocation of the edict of nantes some writers claim that nearly half a million skilled workers in fabrics left that country in the years around 1688 while the battle of waterloo was raging near brussels and the people of rank were so strongly affected by the thunder of the guns of all europe there were thousands of women young and old in that city and within hearing of the great contest who kept right on with their work making laces they knew somebody would win the day and there would be a market for all sorts of finery and the linen laces of belgium were of much importance to society there are many kinds of laces made in brussels but the kind you most see as you pass along the streets is that being made on little cushions by women sitting before their shops and houses with one eye upon their work and the other on those who are passing hoping to get an american to pay a large price for something that he thinks he has seen made it is not an unheard of thing for an american to buy off one of these attractive lace makers lace that came from the machines of nottingham england for machine-made lace is much cheaper than that made by hand pillar lace was probably invented by barbara utman in the middle of the sixteenth century she lived in st annaberg germany and was a woman of great natural ability she was highly honored by the saxons who state with pride that when she died at the age of sixty she had seen sixty-four of her own children and grandchildren point lace of the old sort was the highest form of needle art holy men of old gave their lives to architecture believing they could give glory to god by work in stone beautifully carved and set in the walls of monasteries and cathedrals so it happened that in the thirteenth century the works of their hands reached the highest point in architecture so beautiful is their work even now that those who have studied the subject but little know the date of a building when they see its windows but a century later the nuns had done something of the same sort they had produced from the fine fibers of flax marvelous designs of fleecy lace fabrics that were the wonder of christendom their art was buried with them a point lace is made today but it is far from the excellence of the original work which was a constant prayer of those who gave their lives to the making of it a yankee boy of twenty erastus bigelow thought it would be a good thing to try to invent a way of making coach lace by machinery in forty days he was producing lace at three cents a yard which had cost twenty-two cents then he invented a loom for ingrain carpets this made eight yards a day instead of three that the looms of the time made in making brussels carpet he made his chief triumph seven yards a day was considered a good day's work but he made a machine that produced twenty-five yards of much better quality in the same time he received one hundred thousand dollars for his patents the body of brussels carpet is built on a foundation of linen end of section eleven
Section 12 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 3, March 1900. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Tavarish. The Sycamore Warbler. Bell P. Drury. The last winter was one of unusual severity in the south as well as elsewhere. The cold continued until rather late in the spring and caused the death of numbers of birds that came north too soon. One day the last of March a sycamore warbler flew in at the open door of a cottage in the Indian Territory. It settled familiarly on the dining table picking up crumbs from the cloth. It seemed cold and almost famished, having arrived too early from its winter haunts in Mexico or Guatemala. After satisfying its hunger, it flew about the room, and presently, instead of flying out, it dashed its breast against a mirror and dropped to the floor quite dead. The blow could scarcely have caused death, except for the bird's exhausted condition. I picked up the wee creature to examine its pretty coat. How dainty each ash-gray feather! Some were tipped and some marked with white. The throat had a tinge of yellow, then two colors giving the extra names of white-browed and yellow-throated warbler. This bird frequents marshy lands where sycamore trees flourish. It loves to build its nest in the topmost boughs, safe from all enemies. Here the male, screened from view, sings his song, which resembles that of the indigo bunting, but with a different modulation. When the days became warm, I often saw a happy pair of them, busy, I supposed, in building, but the nests were too high for inspection. End of section 12. This recording is in the public domain. Section 13 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 3, March 1900. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Betty B. The Ruddy Duck, Eris Matura Rubida. Few, if any, ducks have so many popular names as this species, which is known as spine tailed, heavy tailed, quill tail coat, stiff tail, bristle tail, sleepy duck, sleepy coot, fool duck, deaf duck, shot pouch, daub duck, stubble and twist, bully coot, blather scoot hickory head greaser paddy knotty paddywhack dinky hardtack etc according to the locality or the particular individual who is asked to name the species it has characteristics which justify the use of any one or all of these names its range is the whole of north america which extends south to guatemala and colombia cuba and other west indian islands Probably no North American duck has so extensive a breeding range as the present species, since it breeds as far south as Guatemala, perhaps even farther, as far north as Great Stone Lake, York Factory, and other localities in the subarctic portions of the continent, and from the Atlantic to the Pacific. According to Professor Cook, it winters from southern Illinois southward. This duck seems to be equally fond of salt brackish and fresh water in the southern states it is found in great flocks its flight is rapid with a whirring sound occasioned by the concave form of the wings it rises from the water with considerable difficulty being obliged to assist itself with its broad webbed feet and for that purpose to run on the surface for several yards from the ground however it can spring up at once it swims with ease and grace is expert at diving and when wounded often escapes in this way hiding in the grass if there is any accessible the locality usually selected for a nest is some deep sluggish stream lake or pond and the nests are always built close to the water's edge being composed of reeds dry rushes and grass the structure is often made so that it will float 
similar to a grebe's nest it is asserted that this bird prefers the abandoned nests of coots for nesting purposes to those constructed by itself the eggs appear large for the size of the bird they are grayish white oval in shape with a finely granulated surface sizes range from two point three five to two point five o long by one point seven o to one point eight o broad audubon says that the adult female in summer presents the same characteristics as the male he describes the male one year old as having a similar white patch on the side of the head upper part of head and high neck dull blackish brown throat and sides of neck lower part of the neck dull reddish brown waved with dusky upper parts as in the adult but of a duller tint lower parts of a grayish white end of section thirteen this recording is in the public domain section fourteen of birds and all nature volume seven number three march nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org by victoria s Tuller. wings wings that flutter in sunny air wings that dive and dip and dare wings of the hummingbird flashing by wings of the lark in the purple sky wings of the eagle aloft aloof wings of the pigeon upon the roof wings of the storm bird swift and free with wild wind sweeping across the sea often and often a voice in me sings oh for the freedom the freedom of wings mary f butts end of section 14 this recording is in the public domain section 15 of birds and all nature volume 7 number 3 march 1900 recorded for librivox.org by victoria s tuller i know not why i lift mine eyes against the sky the clouds are weeping so am i i lift mine eyes again on high the sun is smiling so am i why do i smile why do i weep i do not know it lies so deep i hear the winds of autumn sigh they break my heart they make me cry i hear the birds of lovely spring my hopes revive i help them sing why do i sing why do i cry it lies so deep i know not why morris rosenfeld end of section 15 this recording is in the public domain Section 16 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 3, March 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. The Brave Boar. Ella F. Mosby. Upstairs, downstairs, and in my lady's chamber the french chronicles of the reign of francis i tell the following wonderful story of a boar hunt twas in a grand forest that stretched for miles around a castle an old-fashioned castle of ramparts and towers 
of wide halls and winding stairways. Oliver, the twelve-year-old son of the master of the castle, had set his heart on going with his father to hunt the wild boar with the gentlemen of the neighborhood. The forest was the home of a great many wild creatures, great and small. Squirrels and hares lived there, wide-antlered stags and timid does with their young fawns beside them foxes, boars that feasted on the black acorns and chestnuts that covered the ground, and fierce gray wolves seen chiefly in winter. The boars were the fiercest of all, even the sows would fight for their young ones, and there was one old boar who was by this time quite famous for his courage, his cunning, and his great age. He was called Picmore which means death thrust, because he had in his savage onslaughts fatally wounded so many men, horses, and dogs. Oliver's father had ordered the great hunt against this very old warrior, who, by the way, had grown so shrewd that he could not always be roused from his secret lair even by the beaters and prickers who went ahead of the hunters but he surely would appear to-day the forest was ringing with horns and bugles the neighing of horses the baying of noble hounds the hallooing and joyous clamour of the sportsmen oliver was well prepared for the occasion old bertrand had taught him all the calls and recalls on bugle and horn had trained him to thrust with the long boar spear and to use the short thick sword kept for the last when the brute was near and the big boar hounds vit vit and the others turned and obeyed his voice when it rang out in its clear boyish treble most important of all his mother had consented to his going but alas and alas when the morning dawned fair and sweet poor oliver was racked with grievous pain and burning with fever the chase swept away with shout and cry and bugle blast and oliver barely heeded it or turned his head when his father called back we'll bring old pigmore home with us however by the afternoon the fever had slackened and the pain abated and oliver lay white and weak on his couch and with piteous tears on his cheeks over the mischance that had held him fast at home he turned his face to the wall in a burst of passionate grief as they heard at first far off and then nearer and nearer the excited yelps of the dogs then the trampling of horses, the hoarse cries of the men, and, oh, the bugle, note of la mort, which meant victory over the famous boar. Oliver, said his mother tenderly, and then all at once came a sound at which both started and threw their arms about each other. In the hall below, up the stairs, came a heavy creature, panting, snorting, and the furious Picmore suddenly burst upon their amazed vision. Sinister and savage did he look, the little round greedy eyes red with rage, the bristles standing up like a cuirass, the sharp and cruel tusks ready for assault and foam and blood churned at their base into a streaked froth by his heat and anger he was within the chamber oliver's arm dropped nerveless at his side and his frightened eyes sought vainly for any weapon the mother had a quicker wit, and stooping down, she seized with both arms a large eastern rug, and threw it over the beast's head, blinding him for a while, as well as blunting the thrust of the terrible tusks. 
as he struggled desperately in its smothering and heavy folds the whole following dogs men and the master at their head were up the stairs also and the death stroke was quickly given it was the end of the veteran of so many chases in morass and thicket piquemore was dead after a moment's half stupefied stare the lord of the castle broke forth well my boy you were at the finish after all the dogs could not be held off their old foe and the brave boar was furious at their baiting and so broke away my lady you have the glory and oliver his wish old bertran stroked his grizzled beard twas a gallant brute he said had he been a man they would have styled him hero he had a high courage and loved freedom well we have grown since those rough days into more compassion for animals but even yet we are not altogether just to their side of the question to the recognition of their right to life and its joys as their merciful creator has given it to them End of section 16section 17 of birds and all nature volume 7 number 3 march 1900 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by betty b getting acquainted with the teacher jesse p whitaker in the summer of 1897 wandering in the woods of pigeon cove on the outer point of cape ann the prolonged call of a bird often came to my ears which aroused my curiosity i was not then much acquainted with birds but was beginning to take notice and usually carried my field glass on my walks and if i saw or heard a bird unfamiliar to me tried to look him up in my books i had with me our common birds and how to know them by john b grant also florence miriam's birds through an opera glass very good books to aid beginners in identifying birds the call of which i speak was so marked and so often repeated that i eagerly searched for the bird but could not get a glimpse of him not even locate the sound accurately i soon perceived however that it was a regular chant increasing in an even crescendo vibrating through the woods i remembered reading descriptions of such a call in the books and soon found my bird to be the oven bird golden crown thrush or teacher bird but why teacher bird i was constantly asking this question for to my ears the sound always came as teachy 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 with accent always on the final syllable by no exercise of the imagination could i make it sound like teacher never during that summer nor during the two succeeding summers have i heard these birds at pigeon cove say teacher the little brown walker kept out of my sight very persistently during that first summer but in september walking in the woods near star lake in the adirondacks i had a good near view of two little olive green birds walking on some low branches their white speckled breasts proclaimed them thrushes while the beautiful crown of brownish orange enclosed in lines of black plainly mark them the golden crown often as i have seen the bird since his golden crown has never appeared as conspicuous as it did on that september day by the mountain lake but i had to go to skinniadley's lake in central new york to hear him say teacher on a may morning in eighteen ninety nine sitting on a mountainside overlooking this beautiful sheet of water the chant of a bird came vibrating through the woods to my ears teacha 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 very distinctly accent clearly on the first syllable this time ah mr burroughs at last i have found your little teacher will any one tell me why this bird with olive back and speckled thrush-like breast is placed in the family mineo to tilde or wood warblers instead of with the tertidae or thrushes and why is the water thrush also classed with wood warblers when his olive back and speckled breast 
make him seem almost a twin brother to the oven bird while both are so unlike other members of the warbler family and so much resemble the true thrushes it was at glenhaven beside a mountain brook tumbling down into skinny Adley's lake that i had my first and only view of a water thrush his clear song repeatedly ringing out above the noisy music of the brook kept luring me onward and upward over the rough banks till at length i saw the little walker peering about among the stones for his food another bird closely resembling the thrushes and bearing the name yet placed in another family is the brown thrasher or thrush i look in my book for his classification family troglodytidae i can scarcely believe my eyes can any one give me any earthly reason why the ornithologists in their wisdom have seen fit to place this bird with his reddish brown back speckled breast and beautiful thrush-like song in the same family with catbirds and wrens truly the mysteries of ornithology are past my comprehension to return to our teacher my acquaintance with him has not yet advanced to the stage of finding him at home in his dwelling as nelchi blanchon says it is only by a happy accident that one might discover the little ball of earth raised above the ground but concealed by leaves and twigs and resembling a dutch oven which gives the bird its name of oven bird last summer at pigeon cove the warning cries of a mother bird led me to suspect a nest but i failed to find it the brood had evidently left their home for a sudden loud outcry from the mother bird startled me as the little thrushes scurried out of the path from almost under my feet while madame thrush fluttered about with the pretense of a broken wing to distract my attention her trailing was quite effective for by the time i had turned my attention from her performance to the babies they were quite out of sight End of section seventeen. Section 18 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 3, March 1900. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Tavarish. The Muskrat. Fiber Ziberthicus. That part of North America which is included between the 30th and 60th parallels of north latitude is the home of this species of muskrat, which is the most numerous of the family, it is most plentiful in Alaska and Canada, which are so rich in lakes and rivers. It is described as a large water mole, with a long tail, broad hind paws, a blunt snout, and short hair-covered ears, which may be closed to exclude water. The fur is close, smooth, soft, and lustrous, the woolly under fur being extremely delicate fine and short the outer coat has a strong luster and is double the length of the former adult males attain a total length of twenty-three inches the tail occupying about half of this grassy banks of large lakes or wide slowly flowing streams and swamps are its favorite haunts though it is frequently seen about large ponds grown with reeds and aquatic plants where it erects a permanent home and dwells either in small colonies or communities of considerable numbers the mode of life of a muskrat is in many respects like that of the beaver for which reason the indians call the two animals brothers and affirm that the beaver is the older and more intelligent of the two the burrows of the muskrat consist of plain underground chambers with several tunnels all terminating under water or of strongholds above ground these are of a round or dome shape stand on a heap of mud and rise above the surface of the water they are lined with reeds reed grass and sedge cemented with mud the interior of the lodge contains a single chamber from sixteen to twenty-four inches in diameter a tunnel which opens beneath the water leads to it in winter it lines its chambers softly with water lilies 
leaves grasses and reeds providing for ventilation by loosely covering the center of the dome-shaped roof with plants which admit a sufficient quantity of fresh air and let the ventilated air out as long as the ponder swamp does not freeze to the very bottom it is said to lead a highly comfortable existence in its warm habitation which is often protected by a covering of snow some observers say that the food of the muskrat consists almost wholly of aquatic plants but audubon saw captive muskrats which were very fond of mussels they are very lively playful creatures when in the water on a calm night many of them may be seen in a mill pond or some other sequestered pool quote, disporting themselves crossing and recrossing in every direction leaving long glittering ripples in their wake as they swim while others stand for a few moments on little tufts of grass stones or logs from which they can reach their food floating on the water others sit on the banks of the pond and then plunge one after the other into water like frogs from three to six young are born in a burrow if caught young they are easily tamed and are of an equable and gentle disposition although some people dislike the fur on account of the odor of musk which clings to it for a long time it is often used for trimming clothing or in manufacture of collars and cuffs especially in america and china the best pelts are deprived of the long outer fur dyed a dark brown color and used as a trimming which resembles seal skin the animal is caught in traps baited with apples the indians know exactly which lodges are inhabited they only eat the flesh as the odor does not seem to be disagreeable to them end of section 18 this recording is in the public domain Section 19 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 3, March 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Not a Sparrow Falleth, Granville Osborne. No traveler in Palestine, the land of sacred memories, will need an introduction to the sparrows. They are as tame, troublesome, vivacious, impertinent as their numerous progeny across the seas. They chirp and twitter, asserting their rights of possession in places where they are not welcome, industriously building their nests in every available nook and corner, and defending them fearlessly against every feathered encroacher. They stop up the stovepipes and water gutters with their rubbish build nests in the windows and under the eaves of roofs and have not the least reverence for any place or thing you see them perching on the loftiest spires of the holy city flitting in and out of minaret and tower wherever an opening invites them to a place of security and shelter for rearing their young they nest in great numbers in the bushes on the banks of the river jordan and band together in defending their nests against the rooks and crows that infest the cane brakes north of lake hula they live on terms of great amity and friendliness with the beautiful wurwar or bee-eater which burrows in the soft earth banks near the outgo of the jordan from the lake of galilee the nests of sparrow and wurwar are so numerous and easy to reach that one might easily gather a peck of their tiny eggs and unfledged nestlings with mother bird and all could they be of use but the mosaic law has a precept especially intended to protect the birds of the air in one portion of the inspired text he writes if a bird's nest chances to be before thee in the way in any tree or on the ground whether they be young ones or eggs and the dam sitting upon the young or upon the eggs thou shalt not molest the dam with the young that it may be well with thee and that thou mayest prolong thy days you will notice how clear is the precept by which we are forbidden to molest these nests we must not the biblical law says 
and to the obedient is the promised blessing of prosperity and long life the contrary calamities clearly implied to those who transgress in its meaning this precept includes all birds and was intended like many other prohibitory commands to cultivate sentiments of humanity and habits of gentleness and so it is that in bible lands the sparrow is more numerous and less liable to destruction than in our own streets fields and parks where every bird of this species is an object of contempt and often lured to its death with countless thousands of victims unsuspecting and easily taken like himself they flit over the field of the shepherds and build nests in the cave of the nativity they cover the fields of wild oats by thousands and chirp and twitter on the hillside where ruth went down to glean a colony will be found in every old tree on the mount of olives and even in the garden of gethsemane they nest in perfect security above the herds of black-robed attendants who are on terms of great familiarity with them the first reference to the sparrow in the bible is an allusion to this habit of the fearless bird in building its nest in the most sacred places it recalls the sad and pathetic period in david's life when he fled from jerusalem pursued by the army of his son absalom who sought his throne and life afar from jerusalem and the temple courts where he led the people in their devotions his heart longed for the peace and holy calm to be found only within their sacred enclosures and he says a day in the courts is better than a thousand my soul longeth for thy courts the sparrow hath found a nest for herself where she may lay her young even thine altars thus he the great king david wished for the rest and peace enjoyed by the humble birds which he had observed so often ministering to their young about the holy altar itself again when absalom falls in battle and word is brought to david in the sadness of his lament o absalom my son my son he compares himself to the tiny despised bird saying i watch and am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop he had no doubt often seen the sparrow when one had lost its mate sitting on the housetop alone and lamenting hour after hour its sad bereavement so again the sparrow is honored above its fellows and its affectionate devotion immortalized but a greater than david has drawn from the humblest one of the feathered tribe a lesson of trust which has touched tenderly in all ages since the heart of every seeker after truth not a sparrow falleth is a sentence that comes very close to the human heart not a sparrow falleth to the ground without your father not one of them is forgotten of him fear not therefore ye are of more value than many sparrows not a sparrow falleth how sweet the words and true without your father's notice who careth still for you o tiny bird so trustful teach me such trust as thine that so the wondrous lesson I may possess as mine. End of section 19。section 20 of Birds and All Nature, volume 7, number 3, March 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish the treating of whitey bertha c v sonia his coat was thin so thin that his skin showed through in patches and the skin was thin so thin that the bones almost pricked through in a mute appeal to the public he walked the streets until his four little feet dragged with weariness and he often sat down upon his haunches to rest. When he stopped, people noticed him, and many turned as they went past, watching him. He was so pitiable a sight. Mangy dog, somebody said, but he was more than that. He was lost, and he was starving. He was so needy that he had forsaken his alley haunts and had come up to the boulevards, where was greater prosperity sunshine cleanliness and perhaps love
toward man and beast. In his walks he chanced near the lake and paced the viaduct that leads out upon the pier. He even went on the pier and looked down into the dark water as many despairing men and women have looked. It seemed easy to fall in, but he turned back and walked away. He had learned that if he kept moving, the police and guards did not poke at him with their clubs. In crossing Michigan Avenue, he had to watch his chances, for the rubber tires of the carriages made no warning sound on the asphalt. And then he came to Wabash, the noise of the elevated and surface trains and of the trucks and drays was so confusing that he had need of more care than ever. At length he reached State Street and sat down to rest. Lizzie and Matty were there before him. They too were acquainted with alleyways, though they were not personally acquainted with Whitey. Evidently they had found nourishment there that Whitey had missed, for Lizzie was decidedly fat, and Matty was fairly presentable. Lizzie wore a faded worsted skirt, poorly joined to a cotton shirtwaist with a green silk belt. Her short fair hair was curled and tied with a green ribbon, and her airy straw hat was bright with flowers. Other little girls of better fortunes had worn the things and had extracted their freshness and much of their beauty. But Lizzie felt quite dressed up beside her friend who wore only a simple calico gown and plain straw hat. She led Mattie from window to window, pointing out precious articles and rare jewels, quite as if she had purse connections with them. The girls glanced at Whitey as he passed. "'Poor little dog,' Mattie said. "'Yes,' returned Lizzie. "'I should think the policeman would shoot him.' "'Why?' queried Mattie in surprise. "'Oh, he's so bad off.' Whitey was moving slowly. He was rested, and he thought to go on. Somebody in a confectionery store noticed the girls. "'Mama, I do believe that's my old belt that I threw in the rags one day, for there is the cross I made on it at school with ink.' "'Nonsense,' said the lady. "'And, oh, Mama, look at the poor dog!' Of all the people who were passing, four at least were interested in Whitey. Alley and Avenue, but the Alley folks first forgot him. They went back to their diamonds. Whitey's troubles had made him meek and humble. He did not, at this time, expect anything, and he was out of hopes and plans. He did not observe any whisperings at the portals of the big store, nor see the wonder on the face of the porter. What he did see presently was a round pasteboard box that the porter set down under his very nose. It was torn a little at one side, and what was in the box began to melt and run down to the pavement. Whitey moved his ears a little at the sight. It actually looked eatable. He doubted if it was, but he put out his tongue and touched it. When Lizzie and Matty turned again, they stood amazed. People were looking amused as they passed, and many a heart was made glad and light. One could read it in their faces. An unusual kindness is a love flash that makes life sweeter to all who get it in their eyes. "'I'll bet there is a quart there,' said Matty. "'No, there ain't, nother. "'I guess a sick dog couldn't eat a whole quart of ice cream. "'It's just a pint. "'Look how he licks it up. "'My, I'll bet it's good.' "'He's a gulpin' to beat the band,' returned Lizzie. "'He never heard it before, I'll bet.' "'Oh, you nother, Matty Black. "'You can't talk much.' answered Matty. By this time Whitey had cleared up his spread pretty thoroughly. Not a drop lingered in the circle at the bottom of the box, and the pavement was dry. 
whitey walked over to the side of the building and lay down in the sun he put his nose between his paws his body was as thin and forlorn as ever but away at the tip of his pink shabby tail was a little short-lived wag it was the language of gratitude and hope it had been absent for days ever since he was lost the little girl who had caused it was riding home in her carriage but the ellie folks took note of it and they were appeased they no longer envied the dog as for whitey the rich cream worked its work as he lay in the sun he felt new hopes and plans revive of a sudden he remembered a bakery where he had chanced to get some plate scrappings he would go again and go he did his body and his hopes were alike nourished with his recent treat whitey actually walked over to the bakery alley with a decided and prolonged wag to his tail the ice cream had placed it there it really made the turning point for better times for whitey end of section twenty Section 21 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 3, March 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. The Poppy. Papaver somniferum. Linnaeus. Dr. Albert Schneider, Northwestern University School of Pharmacy. Sleep hath forsook and given me o'er To death's benumbing opium as my only cure. Milton, Samson Agonistes, line 630. The opium-yielding plant, or poppy, is an herb about three feet in height, stem of a pale green color covered with a bloom. Branches are spreading with large, simple, lobed, or incised leaves. The flowers are solitary, few in number, quite large and showy. The four large petals are white, or a pale pink color, in the wild-growing plants. The fruit is a large capsule, one to three inches in diameter, of a depressed globular form. The seeds are small and very numerous, filling the compartments of the capsule. In spite of the general attractiveness of the plant, the size of the flowers and the delicate coloring of its petals, it is not a favorite at close range because of a heavy, nauseating odor which emanates from all parts of the plant, the flowers in particular. The petals, furthermore, have only a very temporary existence, dropping off at the slightest touch. The wild ancestor of our familiar garden poppy is supposed to be a native of Corsica, Cyprus, and the Peloponnesian islands. At the present time it is extensively cultivated everywhere, both as an ornamental plant and for its seeds, pods, and yield of opium. It has proven a great nuisance as a weed in the grain fields of England, India, and other countries, something like mustard in the oat fields of the central states. There are a number of forms or varieties of the cultivated poppy. The red poppy, corn poppy, or rose poppy, papaver roeas, is very abundant in southern and central Europe and in western Asia. It has deep red or scarlet petals and is a very showy plant. The long-headed poppy, Papaver dubium, has smaller flowers of a lighter red color and elongated capsules, hence the name. The oriental poppy, Papaver orientale, has very large deep red flowers on a tall flower stalk. Various plants belonging to other genera of the poppy family Papaveraceae, are designated as poppy. The California poppy, Escholzia californica, is a very common garden plant. 
It has showy yellow flowers and much divided leaves. Horn puppy, Glaucium luteum, is a rather small seaside plant with long curved pods and solitary yellow flowers. The Mexican prickly poppy, Argemone mexicana, is widely distributed. The pods and leaves are prickly, flowers yellow or white, the seeds yield an oil which is used as a cathartic. Spatling or frothy poppy, Silene inflata, is so called because when punctured by insects or otherwise, it emits a spittle like froth. Tree poppy, Dendromicon rigidum, is a shrub six to eight feet high with large bright yellow flowers. Welsh poppy, Mechanopsis cambrica, a plant found in the wooded and rocky parts of Western Europe, has sulphur yellow flowers and is cultivated for ornament. The use and cultivation of the poppy dates from the very remote times. The plant was well known in the time of the eminent Greek poet Homer, who speaks of the poppy juice as a dispeller of sorrows. Odyssey 4 line to twenty according to plinius the word poppy papaver is derived from papa meaning pap the standard food of infants because poppy juice was added to it for the purpose of inducing sleep the ending ver is from verum meaning true that is this food was the true sleep producing substance opium the inspissated juice of the poppy pods was apparently not known in the time of hippocrates only the freshly expressed juice being used it is through diocles caristius 350 b c that we obtain the first detailed information regarding the use of opium nicandros 150 b c refers to the dangerous effects produced by this drug Scribonius Largus, Dioscorides, Celsus, and Plinius gave us the first reports regarding the origin, production, and adulteration of opium. Plinius mentions the method of incising the capsules. The Arabians are said to have introduced opium into India. It appeared in Europe during the Middle Ages, but was apparently in little demand. It was much more favorably received in the Orient. In 1500 it constituted one of the most important export articles of Calcutta. India supplied China with large quantities of opium, at first only for medicinal purposes. It is said that the Chinese acquired the habit of smoking opium about the middle of the 17th century and since then it has ever been the favorite manner of consuming it the poppy is cultivated in temperate and tropical countries the opium yield of plants grown in temperate climate is however much less than that of the subtropical and tropical countries though the quantity is about the same there are large poppy plantations in india china asia minor persia and turkey as already indicated, the white-flowered variety is quite generally cultivated because it yields the most opium. The plants are grown from seed, and it is customary in tropical countries to sow several crops each season to ensure against failure and that collecting may be less interrupted. Plants of the spring sowing flower in July, the pods do not all mature at the same time. This, coupled with the sowing of several crops at intervals of four to six months, makes the work of collecting almost continuous. Before the pods are fully developed, they are incised horizontally or vertically with a knife. Generally, a special knife with two and three parallel blades is used. The blades of the knife are repeatedly moistened with saliva to prevent the poppy juice from adhering to them. The incisions must not extend through the walls of the capsule, as some of the juice would escape into the interior and be lost. 
as soon as the incisions are made a milky sap exudes which gradually thickens due to evaporation of moisture and becomes darker in color the following day the sticky now dark brown juice is scraped off and smeared on a poppy leaf held in the left hand more and more juice is added until a goodly sized lump is collected these sticky ill-smelling masses of opium are now placed in a shaded place to dry the entire process of incising and collecting as carried on by the orientals is exceedingly uncleanly to the nasty habit of moistening the knife blade with saliva is supplemented the filth of unwashed hands and the sand and dirt of the poppy leaves which are added from time to time to form a new support for the juice as it is removed from the knife in scraping the gum considerable epidermal tissue is also included each lump of gum opium contains therefore a mixture of spittle the filth of dirty hands poppy leaves sand and dust in addition to that many collectors adulterate the gum opium with a great variety of substances Dioscorides mentions the fact that even in those remote times adulteration of opium was practiced such substances as lard, syrup, juice of lactuca, and glaucium being added. Modern collectors and dealers adulterate opium with sand, pebbles, clay, lead, flour, starch, licorice, chicory, gum arabic, and other gums, figs, pounded poppy capsules and excessive quantity of poppy leaves and other leaves etc after collecting and drying the peasants carry the gum opium to the market places where they are met by the buyers and merchants who inspect the wares and fix a price very advantageous to themselves the present trade in opium is something enormous especially in india china and asia minor to the credit of the chinese and the discredit of the english it must be said that in seventeen ninety three the former strenuously objected to the introduction of opium traffic by the latter this opposition by the chinese government culminated in the opium war which led to the treaty of nanking in eighteen forty two giving the english the authority to introduce opium into china as a staple article of commerce the reason that chinese officials objected to the introduction of opium was because they recognized the fact that the inhabitants very readily acquired the habit of smoking opium in spite of the most severe government edicts the habit spread very rapidly after the treaty referred to gum opium contains active principles alkaloids to which it owes its peculiar stimulating soporific and pain relieving powers of these alkaloids of which there are about nineteen morphine and codeine are undoubtedly the most important the properties of gum opium represent therefore the collective properties of all the alkaloids and are similar to the properties of the predominating alkaloids just mentioned Physicians generally agree that opium is the most important of medicines. Properly used, it is certainly a great boon to mankind, for which there is no substitute. But, like all great blessings, it has its abuses. It is the most effective remedy for the relief of pains and spasms of all kinds. It will produce calm and sleep where everything else has failed. It finds a use in all diseases and ailments accompanied by severe pain, in delirium, rheumatic and neuralgic troubles, in dysentery, etc. It may be applied externally to abraded surfaces, to ulcers, and inflamed tissues for the relief of pain. The value of opium does not lie so much in its direct curative powers as in its sedative and quieting effects upon diseased organs which tends to hasten or bring about the healing or recuperating process in some diseases the physician refrains from giving opium as in fully developed pneumonia 
since the quieting effect would diminish the efforts on the part of the patient to get rid of the inflammatory products accumulating in the air vesicles and finer bronchial tubes in fact the soothing effect is too often mistaken for a curative effect and the patient is neglected the roman habit of feeding children pap mixed with poppy juice was a pernicious one many modern mothers give their sick and crying infants soothing syrups most if not all of which contain opium in some form as tincture of opium and paregoric too often the poor overworked mother who cannot afford to consult a physician will purchase a bottle of soothing syrup or cough remedy for her child because she knows it produces a quieting effect which is mistaken for a cure when in reality the incipient symptoms are only masked only a reliable physician should be permitted to prescribe opium in any form the harm done through the use of opium by the ignorant abetted by the inventors manufacturers and sellers of the soothing syrups and cough remedies is insignificant as compared with the harm resulting from the opium habit which is acquired in various ways for instance a patient learns that the opium given him relieves pain and produces a feeling of well-being hence even after recovering he returns to the use of the solace of his sickness when he suffers mental or physical pain and in time the habit is acquired the scholar knowing its properties makes use of it to deaden pain and to dispel imaginary or real mental troubles any and all classes may acquire the opium habit but the majority of opium eaters are from the lower and middle classes as with other vices the predisposing cause is a lack of moral stamina women are more addicted to the habit than men after the habit is once established it is practically impossible to break away from it under the influence of the narcotic the opium eater becomes mentally active hilarious and often brilliant thoughts flow easily and freely in time the patient loses all sense of moral obligation he boasts and lies apparently without the least trouble of conscience as soon as the effects of the drug pass away he becomes gloomy morose despondent and he will resort to any measure to obtain a fresh supply the dose of the drug must be increased continually until finally quantities are taken which would prove fatal to several persons not addicted to its use opium victims take the narcotic in various ways the chinese and orientals in general prefer to smoke the crude opium in special pipes europeans and americans usually take it internally in the form of the tincture or laudanum paregoric or the powder of the sulphate of morphine or codeine frequently a solution of morphine is injected under the skin by means of a hypodermic syringe no matter how it is taken the effects are about the same the treatment of the opium habit consists principally in the gradual withdrawal of the supply of the drug and strengthening the weakened system by proper exercise and diet but as indicated the habit if once fully established is very difficult to cure while as stated most of the opium eaters belong to the poorer and middle classes there are a number from the wealthy idle classes and not a few from professional classes who are slaves to the habit the brilliant and gifted de quincey was addicted to this habit and recorded his experience in his confessions of an opium eater the capsules and seeds of the opium plant are also used the capsules are collected at maturity but while yet green usually during the month of july they are broken and dried in a shaded well ventilated place and finally in a moderately warm place they are then broken in still smaller pieces 
the seeds shaken out and the capsule fragments placed in well-sealed glass or tin receivers the seeds which are known as more seeds are collected at maturity and placed in wooden boxes the seeds yield an oil which is used much like sweet oil artists also use it in mixing colors end of section twenty one